whatever I desire. فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي الْأَنفُسِ وَتَلَذُّ الْأَعْيُنِ وَأَنْتُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ In it, meaning in paradise, whatever your soul desires, whatever is tasty to your eyes, and you will be in there forever, dwelling therein forever and ever. I'm sure we've heard this verse many a time in the past. But do we work towards it? That's a question. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May He strengthen us. We have the houses of Allah. It is not befitting for us to even start speaking about the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we are not even fulfilling our five daily prayers. When we are not even fulfilling our own salah. I've always told the youth and the youngsters, listen my son, do me a favor. Do yourself a favor. What is the favor? Fulfill at least your farad. That's the minimum. We are not saying that that is your duty. Fulfill your farad and walk out. But that is the starting point. It is a starting point. Some people are lazy. They say, you know, the Salatul Isha is going to take me so long. I'm going to have to read the Sunnah and the Farad and the Sunnah and the Witr and so on. And so they say, well, I'm not going to read it. Just leave it. It's okay because I'm weak. I'm weak. The reality is that those are the clutches of the devil. Imagine a man is telling you, this is just an example that came to me now. A man is telling you, I will give you $5,000. And you say, no. I don't have any place to carry that money. So just leave all of it. If you have space for $2,000, take two at least. And you know, it reminds me of the man who was dreaming. And in his dream, someone was offering him something, some money. So it was the other way around where the man is saying, okay, you know what? I'm going to give you $100. He says, no, I want a thousand. He says, no, 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 no. I'm only giving you a hundred. So this man who was sleeping, he says, no, I want a thousand. So the other man is arguing. He says, no, I'm only giving you a hundred. In the meantime, something happened and this man woke up. When he woke up from his sleep, he realized there is no hundred and there is no thousand. So he quickly closed his eyes. He says, okay, just give me the hundred. Let's get it sorted out. <laughs> give me the hundred. Let's get it sorted out. Allahu Akbar. But the point I was raising was that as much as you can fill in your pocket, fill it, take it because you are... Unable to carry a large amount maybe, but at least you will be able to carry something. What happens with us when we look at the salah and we think now I have to make wudu, now I have to go, now I will have to spend so many minutes, what will happen amazingly? We start thinking for example wrongly that let me just leave it all together, I'll just make tawbah a little bit later on, I will repent to Allah. It does not work that way. مَنْ تَرَكَ الصَّلَاةَ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَقَدْ كَفَرٌ do you know that the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, such a big warning, a warning of the exit from the fold of Islam of a person who intentionally abandons salah. This is why a few weeks ago, one of my colleagues was asking me that, you know, when we get each other up in the morning and we, we should be very careful how we word it, because if you're waking someone up, say, for example, wife is getting up husband or the other way around, and say, for example, the wife is saying, listen, my hubby, are you getting up for salah? If he says, no, I'm not. Do you know what he's saying? He is saying, I'm not going to fulfill the pillar that makes me a Muslim. So I'm just leaving it. And it only took you two minutes to do it. It took you five minutes. It took... So don't say, are you getting up for salah? Say, get up. Just say, get up. Because the minute you say, are you getting up for salah? If the answer is no, oh, believe me, it is such a dangerous statement, I don't even feel like uttering how serious it is. A person saying no. It's like telling Allah, you know what? I don't want. And you walk away. How can you do that? So we ask Allah to strengthen us. We need to think of these deep statements as well. Getting someone up, get them up. Are you getting up? Think to yourself, I'm alive, I'm breathing, I've got eyes, I've got so many things. I'm, you know, mashallah, Allah has blessed me so much. Let me get up for the sake of my maker. Start my day with two rak'at of salah. So you start with the farad. Then you come across a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu where he says, Rak'ata al-fajri khayrun min dunya wa ma fiha. In Sahih Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu has explained this hadith Subhanallah, where he says the two units that are read for Salatul Fajr, which is the Sunnah of Fajr, not talking of the Farad. The Farad is already compulsory, it has its own reward. But the two Sunnah, the two units that we are reading pre-Farad, 
The hadith says they are better than the entire world and whatever it contains. Imagine. So get up a little bit earlier. Amazing. Those two units. And this is why when we get to the house of Allah, we should get there a little bit early so that we can read them beautifully. Some of us get there late. And then we want to rush through those two units as though Allah is going to be benefiting from what we are doing. It is us who are benefiting, not Allah. I cannot rush through my salah in a way that I pretend that I am doing a service to Allah. No, I am actually benefiting myself. I'm serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he does not need that act of worship. It is me who needs it. So remember, start off with your farad. My brothers, my sisters, extremely important. That salah, when we get up early morning, not only will we feel good, but we have already been awakened. At that beautiful time, you can go to work on time. You will not be late. Why? You're a Muslim. When a Muslim says, I will be there at 8 o'clock, believe me, by the will of Allah, 5 to 8, they are there. This is why I always say, in most cases, those who arrive late for their appointments have something wrong with the fulfillment of their salah on time. Always. There might be obviously some exceptions to that because people who arrive late due to reasons beyond their control. But if a person is always late for his appointments, what will that indicate? It will indicate that they are not on time for their appointment with Allah five times a day. But a Muslim should be so disciplined that when the adhan goes off already, they are preparing to walk towards the masjid. Imagine. On a Friday, did you know that there is a competition that takes place? A beautiful competition that takes place. Do you know what? Those who come first to the masjid, their names are recorded. This one was first. This one was second. This one was third. The malaika, the angels are standing at the door of the masajid, recording the names of those who came first, second. One uncle comes 10 o'clock in the morning. His name is written every Friday. This man is first. This one is second. That one is third. When the imam gets up in order to deliver the sermon, those books are closed and even the angels come in to listen to what is being said. It's a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu How many of us want to win that race even once in our lives? Once in our lives. A lot of us seated here, mashallah, we've been reading salah for years, alhamdulillah. Jumu'ah, we've all been there. Today, mashallah, we had a beautiful crowd, salatul jumu'ah. But the winner is he who came first. Only Allah knows who that was. And then second and third and fourth and so on. So much so that another hadith says, whoever is there in the first hour, they are as good as he who has sacrificed a major animal for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who comes in the second hour, meaning in the second time, is as though they have sacrificed a smaller animal and so on and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the winners at least a few times in our lives. Something very interesting. The house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the masjid. Imagine myself, if I were to come to your house, I would need to know you at least. I would need to know you a little bit before I just come to your house. I wouldn't like to barge into anyone's home. No, I might not be welcome there. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. If I am close to you, you will find me at your home. If I am not close to you, if I have a problem with you, you'll find me never coming to your home. How many of us have a problem with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why then do we never go to his house? When I say never, I mean Jum'ah, we are there because we heard someone say that if you're not there for Jum'ah, you exit the fold of Islam. So we go there by hook or crook. But we are talking about that which you feel. I want to go to the house of Allah. Why? Do we have a problem with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If you see one man in another man's house every day and the two of them are sitting and having meals together and the two of them are really enjoying the company of each other every day, it means they are so close, they have a beautiful relationship. Tomorrow, if one of them says, brother, I need your help urgently, I'm stuck. The other one will say, okay, leave everything. I'm canceling my trip overseas. I'm coming to deal with whatever the problem is. Why? Because you are very close. One man will cancel his trip overseas because of the sickness of another man's child. If they are very, very close, they can do that. 
So you see the one man in the other man's house and they are sitting and eating together every day. It is indicative of their closeness. What about us, the house of Allah? We are not there on a daily basis. We find ourselves, the relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not as it should be. Do you know why? Because we have the devil who beautifies for us that which is around us in a way that we begin to think this is the main aim of life. So the main aim of life in a lot of cases becomes the materialistic items. I want to marry the king's daughter and I want to be able to buy that particular vehicle and I want to live in that type of a house and I'm going to buy that particular property in the city center and I want to earn a figure, a salary with 12 digits for example. Whoa, subhanallah, that's your aim in life. So mashallah, you ended up marrying the king's daughter, alhamdulillah. You ended up getting that car, you got those phones, you got that salary, you built that house, you built that building, whatever else. Now what? Now what happened? Now you're old. So, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Allahu Akbar. May Allah bless us. You have not yet started you have not yet started getting into building for the investment of the akhirah. Because salah is not in place, zakah is not in place, truthfulness is not in place, you know, protecting from sin is not in place. Those are the things that will earn us paradise. We worship our maker alone. That's what we declare, that's what we say. But do we act upon it? This is why, remember, it's important to learn things connected to the dunya, to this world. Very important. You may have the luxuries and the facilities, but don't make that your main aim. You need to learn survival of the Akhirah. Let me give you an example that I think I've given before. There were these professors who were crossing the river in a boat with an old man who was the sailor. He was rowing away as they're sitting there. And one says, I'm a professor of biology. And the other one says, I'm a professor of geology. And the other one says, I'm a professor of this ology. And the other one says, I'm a professor of hematology. And the other one says, whatever else. And they all look at this man and says, what are you a professor of? He says, I didn't go to school. <laughs> they say, you have wasted your life. Did you hear what they said? You have wasted your life. All he's doing is he's busy rowing. He's rowing the boat. And they're all crossing the river. They're all professors in the ologies. So now, suddenly the waves come. When the waves come, what happens? The old man who's rowing, he looks at all these professors and he says, Have you learned swimology? <laughs> Do any one of you know how to swim? And they said, No. He says, well, you have wasted your life. <laughs> he says, I am a swimologist. And I know diveology. So I will dive into the poolology. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. The moral of that is, I won't end it. You can end it how you want. You can either make them drown or you can make them have survived somehow. But the moral of it is, look at the focus. That is how we operate in this world. We know every ology, but we don't know that Quranology. And you can call it Salahology. Whatever you want to call it, call it. But do we pray? Do we know? Do we have the link with Allah? When the true waves come of death, will we be from amongst those who have survival kits so that we can live happily ever after? Or will we be from amongst those who will have to say, I don't know. I had everything. I was a professor in every ology there was. But today, I don't even know, I don't even have a linker with my maker whom I'm going to return to. Something very important for us to think. You know, we are sound intellects. This country, mashallah, beautiful. We speak English. We understand. We, are, we have read and written. We have top schools, whether it's St. Thomas or any other school. I see the smiles. I just overheard that name today. Subhanallah. <laughs> So it's important for us to know that we have everything laid down. Every time we go to school, we pass the Walla Watta Masjid and Nimmal Road Masjid and what else Masjid, MashaAllah. Everything we pass. 
And we look at it and alhamdulillah, Kolpati Masjid. Every time we pass it, we see, mashallah, they're going to extend this, they're going to expand it, they're going to make it big. Alhamdulillah. We hear that. We say, did you see the new masjid? We are putting up this, that. Mashallah. But we used to carry on going to university and come back, go to school and come back. What was the link with the masjid? Only the word mashallah, if we are lucky. Mashallah. Someone comes from abroad and we take them around. We say, you see, this is a masjid. Okay, we know. How often have you gone there, my brother? How often have you put your head down on the ground for Allah? That is the link. These houses will bear witness for us or against us on the day of Qiyamah. You came here or you didn't. You put your head on the ground. That piece of ground will bear witness forever and ever. So and so and so and so and so and so have put their heads on this ground. I bear witness for the sake of you, O Allah. Are we ready for the ground to bear witness that we have prostrated on it? For the sake of our maker, five times a day, it is not difficult. Come on, strengthen yourselves. You will find, you know, I went to one country. I won't say which country because I don't want to say anything negative about any country. But it's a positive statement I'm about to say. I went to one country and I entered this lounge. You know, sometimes you have access to a little lounge just before you fly. And what happened? I noticed someone from a distance who was not dressed appropriately. And suddenly I went into this little business center where they had a computer and so on. And I was busy with my work. A little while later, I came out and I was walking to the musalla. Musalla meaning the place of salah. As good as a masjid, so to speak, a place of making sajda. So as I was walking out, I noticed the same person covered from head to toe. They had just gone in for salah and they were walking out. That's what I noticed. And in my mind, I said, Subhanallah, this sister, I wouldn't even have known that she was a Muslim. But she has gone in to fulfill her salah. The only way I know is she came out with something from top to bottom. Later on, I saw her again. She was back to her original dress. She had a little handbag. Perhaps she folded up something in her in her handbag and put it in whatever she had 